Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Elise Dorita. Today, Rena Glazer and I will be continuing our conversation and answering questions from our Pro Bono mailbag. Here's the mail, it never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. Welcome back. Let's dive back in and get into our questions from listeners. Before our annual conference, we did a conference preview episode of the podcast, and a listener wants to know how the conference went and what are some of our favorite highlights. So, what are yours? So, ha- the conference seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Yeah, but it took so much part of my life that it also feels like it's just always there, and I'm okay with it. I like it. I thought it went great. It did go great, and I feel like, okay... Let's put aside that we planned it, so we think it was great. That, you know, could be a little awkward. Um, <laughs> but I think objectively, legitimately, it was great. And let's share some of our favorite highlights. Um, other than the ice cream break, which was one of my favorite things. Why? What did you have? <laughs> I didn't have, like, the, the best ice cream because I didn't, like, rush to get to it. I had a strawberry shortcake, but it was ice cream, so I didn't really care. I never get the ice cream. And I you, love ice cream. Because you missed it? Yeah, I always miss that break. But this year at your expo, they kept the freezer, so there's no reason why I, I saw couldn't that. have gotten an yeah. ice cream. But I opted for the soft pretzels, which I really enjoy. Cheese sauce and mustard was available, so. I mean, they were hyped, the pretzels, and they lived up to my expectations. I believe they did, too. Okay, so let's talk <laughs> content uh, and get away a little bit from the food. Um, which actually, I thought one of your favorite publications, if you listen to the first part of this episode, we talked about favorite pubs. We have a pub called Food for Thought. So we'll have to get into that in the future. Um, what about sessions? What sessions did you especially like or ones that you went to? And again, this doesn't mean we didn't like others. It's just ones we wanted to reflect on today. I really liked the uh, Juvenile Lifers a session. I thought it was really good. Um, Hayes Hunt was one of the panelists, and he actually also was recently on the podcast, and he touches on some of the things he talked about in the session, uh, which is also about this case that he worked on from this man, uh, Tyrone, who um, was in prison when he was a juvenile and was sentenced to life and getting him out and how that went. And I thought that was super interesting. Um, I also loved the Family Law Session, which also had another podcast person on it, which is um, Michael Lucas, who has, was a few months ago, um, and that one was really great. Um, I, I'm trying to think of where else I attended. I was just so busy all day. The Power of the Possible was really good, too, about um, Atlanta immigration. And what were some of yours? So first I'll shout out to Whitney Unteed, yes. right, also a podcast guest, and she was on the Juvenile really? Life First Session. Yeah, for sure. So one session that I went to and I really liked was called Pro Bono Credit, What's in It for Me? And it was incredibly inside baseball about how can law firms incentivize their people to do pro bono, what types of credit works, how do you treat pro bono in a way so that people don't feel like it's not in their best interest to do it or that they have to do it on their own time and what moves the needle in terms of really engaging people. So totally inside baseball, but I thought that the leaders did an amazing job. Um, one of them, Allegra Nethery, I think you just heard about at Cypher Shaw. Kimberly McLean talked a lot about how great Allegra is, and she did a great job at this session. So did Roz Nasdor from Ropes and Gray. And you could tell there was a lot of energy in the room. It was really well attended, and it was just what people wanted to know, right? Lots of concrete, actionable items. So I thought that that was a great session. I will do... Uh, a shout out to one of the sessions I did about Second Acts, which is um, our project and projects going on around the country to involve baby boomer lawyers, lawyers who are nearing the end of their careers or thinking about retirement or stepping back from their commercial practices and how we can tap those lawyers to do more pro bono work. And I wanted to talk about that session because I think we're going to talk more about Second Acts in a future pod um, and not just because I was on it, but I um, I think sometimes we get into this idea that the best sessions are the most well-attended sessions. It's kind of an ego thing, like, ooh, look at all the people I was able to attract, or ooh, 
ooh, look how full the room was. This session had three people and there were three speakers. So yay, Sue Finnegan, one of our first podcast guests, right? And Terry Henley from Troutman Sanders, also a podcast guest. So it was like a pod trifecta, which was amazing. And producer Dave was in the session with us. So it was just fantastic. But it was like a private tutorial. We all sat around the table and I really felt it's like office hours when you just get to go speak to your professor and get whatever nuggets you need. So if someone else is asking questions you don't care about, you're like, this is lost time. I'm bored. I don't care about this. So it was like on point for what those people People needed so I also wanted to just do a shout out for the well less attended session it doesn't make them less awesome they're all awesome so a little bit on that what else do you have more have you gone through your list I do actually um, I went to this session called can I be frank uh, and it was about navigating difficult conversations it was on Brenna from Scadden and Annie from Bronx Defenders and it was really good. Like, it, outside of pro bono, inside of pro bono, it was just, like, really useful skills to have in life. And I've actually, like, used some of the things from it. Like, talking to my friends. Like, do not script the conversation before you have it. Like, things like that. And I thought it was just useful for any person in, to know all those things. And I thought it was really cool because I was walking in and not knowing what to expect. And I took a lot away from it. Sure. Human behavior. I bet it was in your wheelhouse as a psych major. Yeah. That's probably yeah. why I, I linked up with it so much. That's awesome. And we're validated for not scripting this uh, episode. So yes. there we go. Who knew? I did not know that. Um, others? I really liked the expo. I mean, that's because it's the fruit of my own labor and it's like my child's, but I still really liked it. I thought it was, there's a lot of people there and I met a lot of interesting organizations. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. So I have two more. One was a session called Ferguson Fines and Fees, which I thought was just very of the moment. I think if you read the paper or watch the news, you are hearing a lot about, and I think it bubbled up to our consciousness here in the United States based on what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. And we learned a lot about how court systems fund themselves through fines and penalties. And it's basically the criminalization of poverty, right? You can't pay a certain ticket and then all these collateral consequences happen that just spiral your life downward and downward and downward. And it's all that so our municipalities can fund themselves. You know, poor people are now profit centers. Um, and there's some incredible work going going on with amazing public interest and civil rights groups, assisted by law firm pro bono um, help, you know, in all quarters of the country, not just where they physically are located, to change public policy and to say, this is wrong, and this is unconstitutional, and this makes no sense, and this is falling disproportionately on the least among us. And there, it's outrageous, and there are better ways to do this. And I think it was just a very inspiring and, and motivating session. And what I, I thought was kind of tangential but really interesting about that session, because you think it's like uber domestic, right? Ferguson, fines, fees, what a U.S.-based session. There were a lot of international attendees that chose to attend, and I'm not sure if it substantively has much resonance in the way their country's systems operate, but they were interested enough, you know, in coming and learning and just being inspired that I thought that that was super cool. I think producer Dave was in that one too. Did you like it? Thumbs up? Yeah, I did like that session. Great. He's saying, yeah, he did like that <laughs> session. <laughs> so one last one I wanted to talk about, which I also... It sort of blew my mind. It was so great. Although the room was incredibly full. It was in a small room and it was very tight. And it was really warm in there. So physically, it was not so comfortable. But the content was amazing. And it was called Everything You Wanted to Know About UK Pro Bono But Were Afraid to Ask. And it was an amazing tutorial on pro bono in the UK. And basically the UK legal system as fill in the blank Americans. We just tend to not know these things, but because so many, just speaking on the law firm side, so many law firms 
have offices in London, big presence in the UK, and want to engage their UK lawyers, or they've gone through mergers, or you know, for whatever reason, and the same would exist on the corporate in-house side, where you know multinational companies have big presence there, given at least for now what the UK is like and and what London is like. Um, it was just an amazing hour of tutorial of the legal scheme, what's different and opportunities and the differences in fundings and where you go for projects and what the benefits are, what the obstacles are. And it was fantastic. Just the content was fantastic and they were so entertaining and um, inspiring. And again, you could see people who would come to that, right? People are really needing help with this issue. And it was so concrete. They prepared this amazing handout. And you could just see everyone, their attention it was just captivating, right? They were just hanging on every word. Again, it was so warm, you could have fallen asleep. You know, if you were bored, it was pretty easy to sort of check out. But instead, uh, the attendees were just kind of eating out of the palms of their hands. It was just so great. The information was so rich and full and meaningful. It was, it was really great. I'm glad you mentioned these sessions because these are ones that like, I wanted to go to, but I didn't get to go to because I mean, we can only be in so many places at once. And speaking of a session I didn't get to go to, but I did learn about that I really liked was the lessons from our past session about um, the Korematsu case in Japanese internment and kind of how it can be relevant now. And that was incredibly moving. And I thought that one was so great. Yeah. So um, do you have any other conference recaps? No, I, other to say, time for planning 2018 is now. <laughs> so if you have ideas, suggestions, questions, send them our way. So we have another question from a listener asking, what are we working on now? So um, I can start off by mentioning what I'm working on. So we're gearing up for membership, which is um, actually one of my favorite times of the year, oddly enough, because I, I really like the process and all that. But um also, we just came out with our challenge poster for 2017. We have some new signatories on it this year, such as Greenberg Traig, Ropes and Gray, and Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. And um, we are always working on the podcast and always taking submissions for ideas and guests. So if you have an idea or um, someone you think that might be a great fit, uh, you can feel free to contact us and let us know. And... There's actually a really big thing on the horizon for us, which is in about a month, we'll be releasing our 2016 report on the law firm pro bono challenge. And many people have asked us, what do you report on and how do you report back? So um, I can just do a quick overview of it and we'll maybe talk about it more. That's great. And we maybe will do another state of pro bono pod mm -hmm. when the results are out and kind of dig into the data and the trends a little more. So I think this is kind of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. What do we collect? What do we look at? What kind of inputs do we have? Uh, what kind of metrics are we looking at? So we look for pro bono hours, the amount of time spent on pro bono, which translates to the percent of time dedicated to pro bono work. Sure, because in the words of the challenge, we ask that firms commit to do either 3 or 5% of their billable hours. So there is that kind of percent baked into the, the commitment. And then we ask about um, the amount of work done for people with limited means, which is a little different than just being because not all pro bono work is for people of limited means. Right, and that may surprise people that you could have pro bono work that is, isn't all pro bono work for people of limited means, and in certain ways, yes, but there are categories of work that serve the greater public good, um, and the beneficiaries are more than just um, low-income people. So if you look at civil rights work, environmental work, work like that where, yes, we're all affected. <laughs> we're all potentially impacted. And that would not necessarily, just super general, we, we look at each specific representation and decide, be dedicated work for low-income people or organizations that serve them. And this is 
part of the challenge, we ask that at least a majority of a firm's pro bono work be work for people of limited means or organizations that serve them. And this is a really critical part of the challenge, that we collect this data and that we're able to measure and monitor how much of the overall pro bono docket is serving this population. And the main reason that this helps is when advocates go to secure funding for legal services organizations and the Legal Services Corporation, one pushback is, is you know, or one line of defense that you hear for people who want to say no is that the private bar needs to do more, right? We don't need to pay for this as a society. Lawyers should just do more pro bono. And if we are able to, with data, right, evidence-based arguments, not just narrative, say, we're doing all we can. <laughs> Big law firms can't do any more, right? They, their pro bono work is dedicated and committed to low-income individuals. We as a society need to do more. We need to do better. So it's really not just a vanity data collection. It serves a real public policy and advocacy perspective. And the entire access to justice community really depends on this information. So it's been a real effort of ours to make sure challenge firms track, collect, and report on this aspect of the challenge. Great. So we have some other questions that are that we asked, like uh, the attorney participation, not just overall, but we break it down by attorney type, partners and counsels and uh, staff attorneys, and there's associates. more associates, yeah. the big one, yeah. um, and we break it down by that, and, and it's interesting. Yeah. And so why do you think that's important? I think it's important because when you're at different levels of a career, it's I think it's interesting to see kind of how, like, it does not matter where you are in your career, that, like, it still is an important thing, and, like, whether you're on, like, one end of the totem pole or the highest person in the firm, like, it's a priority to everyone, and I think that it's nice to know that and to see that, and with data, like you said, within just, like, I was just saying it, like, there's evidence that that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, and the challenge asks that a majority of your partners and associates, and now these other categories of lawyers that firms have developed over the years, participate in pro bono. Because as you can imagine, if you have a pro bono program that's very associate heavy or very heavy only at the entry or junior level, that can lead to some vulnerabilities, right? And so you want to look at pro bono kind of up and down the line. And as we mentioned, our Second X program, you know, some firms um, have struggled with partner participation. I think actually we talked a lot about that in our mailbag. Yep. Partner participation, right? Wasn't that the topic? Yeah. So if that's an important and pressing issue to you, go to the archives and find that episode. Um, so it's interesting to track, right, and see where the weaknesses are and where the strengths are. And looking at participation and participation rates, I think is a really meaningful way to look at the health of your pro bono program. I think raw hours are difficult. Like I don't know what 80,000 hours means and I don't know how that compares often because I'm not so great at math, but also because so many variabilities can go into that. Like was your firm bigger, smaller? Were they, I mean that could affect, is 80,000 good if you have like 20 lawyers? That sounds impossible, right? Is 80,000 good if you have 5 million lawyers? That doesn't sound that good. So, you know, add percents to me um, help because they control for a lot of that um, size and things like that. And so it helps me to know, you know, if, again, the raw hours, that's hard for me to put in a context, but if 95% of your attorneys are participating, I like that. Like, that sounds good. I mean, 100% is amazing, too, but 80%, that also sounds, like, legitimately awesome. 35% of your attorneys, I think we need to work with you. I mean, some, you know, there's probably a lot of room for improvement there. So that tells me about the embeddedness of your pro bono culture and how strong it is. Um, so I think that that's an important data point. Yeah, and I definitely agree with you about the percentage being the significant thing to know as our project self-appointed stats whiz here. Um, yeah, I definitely agree that that's something that it's more telling because it's 
showing you a rate rather than all these variables, like you said, that can come up. So um, when we're analyzing our, our data, we also then break it down the answers to the questions by region and analyze that. So from our statistical point of view, uh, we have talked about this before and how that is a little unique. Did you want to talk about that? Sure. I actually, I'd love to hear from listeners on this. I think we could use some input as to whether this is valuable. I see why it's appealing, right? Don't you want to know how the Northeast does compared to the West Coast, compared to the South, compared to the Midwest? That sounds really appealing. I would want to know that too. I really would. My issue and why I pull out my hair, and I have very short hair, but I'm pulling it out, um, is that I don't think the inputs that we get really allow us to look at it in that way. So let me explain a little bit. We get this data from a law firm for the law firm writ large, right? They do not report their pro bono performance for each office individually, if they would do that, we could do more slicing and dicing. But we just take a law firm, and as law firms have grown since the challenge began, they have offices sort of everywhere. They're not just a few offices based in a certain region. I think 20 years ago, this made a lot of sense, right, when firms had one or two offices max, and it was really easy to assign a region to each firm. Um, because you knew where they, their only office was, or it was so clear that their most dominant by size office was in Boston. We're going to call them, right, the, the Northeast, New England, you know, the Northeast region. Now, you know, your historic home office could be in Boston, but you could have a majority of your lawyers working in other regions, right? You know, just based on firms or equal, you know, half and half. We still call that firm a Northeast firm. So I think it's like misleading, right? That it doesn't mean the work being done in that region is the best, you know, or that, that, that you know, the Mid-Atlantic when we count the firm's office in California as mid-Atlantic, right? Because that's where we have home-based the firm. So I've just become increasingly Debbie Downer <laughs> on this breakdown because I just, I think it is, it can be misleading. We've actually had reporters sort of represent on what it's saying in a way that just seemed inauthentic to me, right? Kind of like, yeah, it would make sense if this was only lawyers in Washington baked into this number. Only that, you know, only those ingredients went into this reporting. But since it's the firm countrywide, ugh, you know, I, I, I really think you could have a case where the bulk of their pro bono is being done elsewhere and a certain region is getting all of the credit. And I, I mean, maybe that's overanalyzing it, but I, it's... It's been a concern to me how to, how to look at this. Yeah, I, I think that's a valid concern because even like when I go through the report from my other perspectives, like I can see where there there'd be like some variables there such as that that definitely might not make it the most ideal statistic as in as if you broke down by office, it might be a little different so, like you're saying. Right, so what you'd want is, you know, answer these questions and just break it down for each of your offices. And we know you have it. You know, it went into compiling the cumulative, so it's just a few more keystrokes. So I think in the ideal world, that's where you transition some of this. But this is the real world, and I don't think anyone wants to do that. <laughs> so maybe you do. Let us know. Um, maybe we could do a pilot project, you know, and see or see if people would like to volunteer and say, yeah, I don't mind, and it's a couple more keystrokes, and, and we'll see. But to get enough that we could actually analyze and report, mm, I'm pragmatic, and I'm not sure that that would work. But it would be great. It would. It would be very good to get a, a significant statistic. Here's another question that would be great to get a significant statistic on. And this is, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the mandatory questions that each challenge signatory commits to answer. And there are only three. So it's not like this is an onerous process. And if your firm is thinking about being a signatory, let's talk. It's, it's really not difficult or burdensome. But we ask some optional questions, too. And one of the optional questions 
you know, in a way you wish could be mandatory because it would be great to have more information on this. And this is about charitable giving. And it's about, you know, please tell us the amount that your firm donated to legal services organizations, not all charities, not all charitable giving, but just legal services providers uh, in the past year. And I think that echoes what we were talking about earlier about making the case that law firms are being as generous as they can with their time, their people, and their treasure. And collecting that data helps us, right? When we see a trend that firms, you know, despite hiccups in profitability and despite hiccups in the legal economy are being generous, that buoys the arguments that we as a profession are doing all we can. And when we see retraction, that's a challenge, right? That means we could maybe dig a little deeper as a profession. Um, and we've done pretty well. Firms have been, A, they've been excellent at being generous, but we've done pretty well at the data collection. And people have been giving us more and more of that information, and that's helpful. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that a lot more often than not, people do answer that question. So that's uh, nice to know that that's something people want to share. Keep it up. And as for all of this, we only release aggregate statistics. So we are not producing a chart that shows firm A gave X amount. You do not have to worry about that. We really keep this stuff under lock and key. So it's all carrots, no sticks, no shame. <laughs> and there's some other optional questions that we asked, which you um, touched upon a little bit. So we ask um, what activities and projects that people are working on if they want to share that and how they report their pro bono activities, whether it be like a newsletter or any other way. And then we also ask for additional materials if anyone wants to provide them so we can add it to our ever-expanding resource clearinghouse, which we mentioned in our first pro bono mailbag if you want to learn what our favorites are. So I'm curious to see what the new trends are for this year and if we see similar data. So um, keep a lookout for that report. Yep. Stay tuned. Yep. That's it for our most recent pro bono mailbag. Thanks, Rena, for answering these great questions with me. If you have a question or comment, let us know, and your question could be featured in our next pro bono mailbag. New and archive episodes of the podcast can be found on iTunes and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Please take a moment to leave an iTunes review. It's quick and easy to do. We'd appreciate the feedback and would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show and expand the conversation about pro bono and access to justice. To learn more about PBI, go to probonoinst.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and questions to probono at probonoinst.org.